your case or your site, do you want me to share it? Kind of on your own clock, thank you. Can't share. So you come in, you do share. Let me see. Oh, sorry, it's because I'm doing it. Okay, try it again. No. Should we get started? You want to do it? You want me to do it? Oh, good, everybody. Um, just quick logistics. The mic is up front, so I encourage people to come up front. And for those who want to speak up at that microphone, um, during the chair's lunch, we found that it, was, it wasn't projecting as well. So as you come up to the mic, just make sure you speak up well. Um, for those remote, can you hear us? Okay. Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Wednesday uh, IETF 118. This is the Trusted Execution Environment Provisioning Working Group Session. Um, if you're not expecting to hear about TEEP, you are likely in the wrong session. So next slide. Okay, so... By now, hopefully you all are very well aware of the note well for the IETF policies for how we run sessions, conduct the sessions, um, and contact, conduct, <laughs> as well as um, participation in here. So I'm just gonna go through this quickly. Um, for those who are in person, I think I just mentioned try and be, I mean, this is a, a huge room. There's only a few of us, so come up. Um, use the Meet Echo. We no longer do um, blue sheets, but I don't see the... Okay, so before we get started, you might want to use your phone to get on, to get the attendance. Um, also, to get on the queue, please use the Meet Echo. Uh, for the remote participants, make sure your audio and video are turned off unless you are 
presenting. Go ahead, Paul. Hi, sorry, just a clarification. It's not might want to use the QR code, but like, please do it. It is the blue ah. sheet. You must do this. I, I try to be passive, but yes. Please make sure you use the QR code to log your attendance. Okay, um, I think I've already covered this. Wow, I have never had people come up to the mic during the... Go Sorry. ahead, Tom. Is the on-site um, button the same as the QR code? So if I... Is it... Okay. It, it should be, yes. Yeah. We're all friendly here, so I don't have to do the code of conduct reminders. Um, move to the next one. So... Um, the non-com still is requesting feedback, so please provide your feedback. Um, they've actually extended the deadline until noon our time <clears throat> for those who are remote. Tomorrow, I encourage you to provide feedback on any, we have lots of potential candidates for all of the different area directorates as well as the IETF chair. And so um, you can either do it directly through email or you can go to the website, all right? So with that, um, I am still looking for volunteers to help with taking notes and the Jabber is now Zulip. Um, and so if I can't get anybody on Zulip, I'll monitor it. Um, but if I can get somebody to please, at least one person, if not two, thank you, Hannes. And Okay, and Steve, yes. All right, so with that, we have sort of a full agenda, but our two main uh, getting close to the, the home stretch here. Um, we've got the hackathon report to help us as we've been progressing and maturing the protocol draft. So Akita and Akuda will provide the report. Um, not yet, Akita, we're still bashing. And then um, Dave will give us the latest updates, hopefully final updates, so that we could move this forward to IESG request. Um, since we, we, Dave has been responding to working group last call. So unless there's any changes to the agenda, going once, going twice, we can start. Okay, so Akita. Yes, I will start from Deep Suit Hackathon. We did the joint hackathon on Saturday, Sunday. Next page, please. Yes, um, participant Dave uh, Isobe-san, Okuda-san remotely, he and uh, Muhammad Os Osama and Hannes, Hank and me. And I think there was a few more other people we talked to, but um, Yes, thank you. Next page, please. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the T protocol draft is close to the closing and we wanted to, to finish details as much as possible. So um, the, the, the action item was time to support more um, courses sign. I'm going to talk later in the next slide. And also the matching the uh, cipher suit uh, profile between the TIP and suit MTI. And Okuda-san showed me his uh, former verification code in the last IT-117. And he came up with the implementation. And so we, we, we went through it. So next page, please. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Um, yes. So in the specification, TAM server is not only going to use, uh, should have the capability, I mean, good to have a capability to have different sig um, sign algorithm and cosine sign, difference of cosine sign and cosine sign one, it's very confusing, but cosine sign will support multiple uh, algorithm and cost assign one or supports only one algorithm. So it's not the other way around. And, uh, and the, 
and to support it on at the um, TAM server, the, he is using Node.js in the implementation of the um, Cosa JS he is using is uh, only supporting Cosa sign one. So um, he had he had to fork it and then add the implement, um, capability to the Node.js uh, Cosa JS for the Cosa sign, and uh, and it's it's working. So I hope the he. Isobe-san's code JS going to be um, merged in the mainline code JS in the future, and it's going to be good for the T protocol and also for the in the public for who use Node JS. Which way I should point? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, this is way. And next is the Cipher suit. Um, so. Uh, Teep is using suit uh, manifest and uh, geez, it's a small font. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So, uh, and when we when we were uh, progressing the suit MTI draft and Teep draft, um, initially it was a uh, um, referring um, as a norm. norm normative reference to the suit MTI. So we don't have to, uh, TIP agent don't have to um, enforce supporting different uh, algorithm, um, reducing the possibility to ha have a different, um, have to implement multiple algorithm and on for the TIP protocol. And uh, the, between the suit MTI ch um, changing from Zero, zero, dash zero one to zero zero two. It uh, the the supporting MT um, argument for the A AES one twenty eight GCM was changed to CTR. I honestly I don't uh, matter which it, it's going to be preference, but uh, and uh, so the so the and it changed to dash zero two. It became to A AES one twenty eight CTR with it and another one. Alternative for the AES128 was uh, chosen the Chachapodi, which is pretty common for using as a um, alternative. And so, it we had to match it with the with AES128 GCM. So we put all together. So now we have AES128 CTR and AES128 GCM and Chachapodi. And the reason only have a Chachapodi with the EDDSR is. Uh, Typically, um, I see the implementation who is using Chachapodi is combining with the ED21156. I, is that the number I co correct? Yeah. But, so, uh, and, uh, and then, and also another thing I slightly changed in the, during the hackathon for the suit MTI is suit MTI in the draft, it had a normative referencing pointing to suit encryption, but, um, it's it's a suit encryption is using suit MTI and not other way around. So I change it from normative reference to the informative um, reference, and that is published as suit MTI zero three, and tip was published as uh, dash uh, tip uh, dash one eight, and yes, and this is the not directly related to the TIP protocol draft, but um, Okuda-san was, uh, um, he, his interest is a former analysis, former verification, and he used the TIP protocol partial portion of the, <clears throat> to uh, test his former analysis code. And he implemented in ProVerif and Tamarin, I hope the pronunciation is correct. And yes. Um, I will. He, this uh, <clears throat> formal verification code is uh, um, just the beginning of his uh, the, um, evaluation on, on his formal verification. So it's not checking um, all the uh, um, all the all the sequence of the T protocol. Only from it's going to be in a third page. So and his code is uploaded on the GitHub. So whoever whoever who has a uh, interest, it's a good 
good boy, a place to go to see it. And we had a feedback from Mohammed and Hannes and Corey and doing the hackathon. And so the related work was from already uh, on, on the public. And yes, uh, Mohammed, did you like to talk right now or? Yes, oh. Hi, Osama from Deep Residence. So I'm, I'm quite surprised that you didn't mention the issue that we found. So it's not that we had uh, just looked at the verification, it's that the verification itself is incomplete. The two uh, properties that were mentioned in the, in the code that, that said that it's been verified, it's actually not verified. So the way ProVerif works is that there are two different levels, applied Pi calculus and horn clauses. And once you, do, until you reach, until you have the reachability of the property, you cannot claim that the property itself is verified. So that was a misinterpretation and it's very clear that the properties are not verified. I added an issue and uh, I just wanted to um, uh, just bring it to notice that it's, it's it, the formal verification itself is incomplete. It's the properties uh, which are claimed to be verified, the two of them are actually not verified, neither secrecy, nor uh, integrity. Mm. Can, so I, the, can I talk? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for someone's comment. Uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. But um, uh, in my opinion, the phrase cannot be proved means uh, we check the user uh, should check the result or trace the, uh, the problem get rid the process. Uh, so then uh, we can find uh, when we can find the cannot be proved, we find we find we analyze the trace uh, and uh, we find the results. We find the uh, probability can get reached the uh, all of the process. So yeah, the probability get, uh, is reachable to all of the events. But uh, as you know, uh, no, the, I, I will I will sorry so sorry to to interrupt um, at this point. So, so um, it's it's the reachability as I said, is of two different things. One is the applied by calculus level at which you yes. write your model. And yes. there is an internal translation inside ProVerif. I've been using yes. this tool for four years. So there is horn clauses level at which you have the reachability. When the tool says it cannot be proved, it actually means that it cannot prove it back at the applied by calculus level. So having yes. it at the horn clauses level is an abstract level intermediate step within ProVerif. It doesn't yes. mean anything. So that reachability is not the same as the reachability at the applied by calculus level. So that is a misinterpretation that you had. I think I tried to clarify it in the meeting that we had with Hannes and Corey, but uh, anyway, I just brought to, I just wanted to, you You can double check it from uh, anyone like uh, maybe the developers of ProVerif. I'm pretty much sure about this. This reachability is not the same as the reachability at the applied by calculus level. And unless, okay. you have, uh, unless you have the reachability at applied by calculus level, you cannot claim that the property is verified. This is just saying at a, maybe those who are not familiar with formal methods, it's just saying that I have a protocol which never sent anything on the channel. Um, I have uh, two parties, let's say I have- um, Excuse me, can I um, make maybe a very- maybe just, maybe just one short okay, sentence. Okay, so, 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 okay. so, just to conclude the last sentence. So I have two parties, A and B. I never sent anything on the channel. Proverif will say that it's completely secure channel. So, so that's, but, but it's useless. So, so we have- Okay, um, yeah. Money. Yeah, and, and you're right. And there are differences. I think there are, uh, you mean, there are differences. So reachability in horn type clauses and, and pi type calculus. And we only find the result as uh, uh, each of them. So we should check the it, uh, both of them in terms of the both of them. You're right? Yes, you, you should actually check them. Otherwise, having it at the horn closing level does not mean anything. It okay. should be checked at the applied by calculus level. Um, okay. Can I make a wrap up? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so the former verification is the tool to make a, a checking the properties. In this case, was only one, ra one um, round trip uh, message checking uh, secrecy. And what was one more, what was the other uh, integrity property? Huh? Integrity. Integrity, yes. So there's many things um, in the verification code could uh, uh, check. Uh, in this time, we only 
try, he, Okuda san started to try the only two properties, scarcity and the integrity, and that's all. And we, and how to make a, a pure uh, verification for the two property is we could go on and not yes. just, yes, in the future. Yeah, yeah, it can yes. go on. I, I'm just uh -huh. saying that these are not proved as it is in the state. Yes, the and repo, it's, it's not proved. Yes. So okay, yeah. We, we it's, never it's, said it's, uh, it's uh, finished, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I have a suggestion. To, to so try a trying phase. Yeah. Yeah, I suggest keep on the formal analysis, but we'll keep making progress mm -hmm. on the draft, right? Sure. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, and honestly, this is not about the draft. It's about the how to improve the verification code. Mm -hmm. So this is the this is the only partially um, what Okuda-san was working. This one two two random trip uh, sequence. And uh, so uh, yes, this is the okay. And so the summary is T protocol draft one one dash one eighteen is up and the MTI is dash zero three is up up out. And formal analysis will continue. The code is will be improving because we only have two properties um, trying to um, uh, verify. And yes, and and Okuda-san came up with the nice um, mascot or logo. Yeah, so we might use that somewhere in the GitHub or whatever in the future. Yes, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> I need to take a picture. Okay. <laughs> oh, like, that, like this one? <laughs> Let's see. That's it. It's finished. Yes. Thank you. That was, that was fast. Yeah. Dave? All right. All right, so I'm going to talk about the uh, protocol. And at the time that I did the slides, it was on draft 17. But as you'll see towards the end, we submitted draft 18 uh, this week after the draft window opened again. Uh, just as a reminder of the timeline, this has already gone through working with last call. We already have the document Shepard write up. Uh, we had an interim meeting joint with suit back on uh, September 11th. Well, the main open issue was uh, about the dependency from the TEAT protocol into the suit MTI document, which was still undergoing some revs. And so uh, as of that time, it wasn't locked because we needed to snap to whatever suit MTI would do. Okay. So that's where we were at at the uh, September intro meeting. Uh, as a reminder, here is the set of normative references that the document has. And so obviously it can't pop out as an RFC until all of these do. The one that's at the tail end, the, the, the longest pole, if you will, is the bottom one, um, which has not yet gone through working group last call in suit. And so that's the one that's trailing everything else. Um, but the expectation is that the uh, suit chairs, of which uh, I am one until the end of this week, uh, we will put it into working group last call very shortly. And so it's not trailing by that much. All right, so changes since September up, oh, Russ. We'll recognize you in a few. Okay. So, <laughs> so about 10 minutes ago, um, Brendan posted something on the last one. Yes, I will talk about that. To confirm that this solves your open issue. Yes, I will talk about it on the, on the later slide. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah, I, I have a slide on the MTI things. And yes, I did see the message. It was posted about an hour and 20 minutes ago, about five minutes to noon. And I did read it. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Brendan, if you're, if you're on the list of participants. All right. Um, all right. So since the September meeting in the last two months, okay, uh, here are the things that uh, have been changed since draft 17. Uh, so the first one we actually fully discussed and agreed on the resolution of during the interim meeting. And so, and this one, I'm not going to repeat it here because all we did in the draft was we put in the text what was on the slides in the interim meeting, right? So um, we already had consensus on that. Um, the second one, uh, Hannes did a review of a bunch of things, and so we made a number of editorial changes. So this is the first one. Um, in all the examples, we had manifests, or a couple of, a couple of uh, manifests and examples. 
And in the examples, the uh, suit manifest file names all ended in .suit. And uh, Hannah said, well, maybe some people could read this as saying .suit is like a registered extension or it's mandatory or something like that. And that's not the case. And so we just deleted .suit out of the end of the file names in the examples. Uh, the next one was that there is a sentence, um, all the bullets there are quotes from the text and the strike through sentence was deleted. It was an informative sentence that we just deleted. And so it used to say, if evidence is not encrypted by the TIP agent, then it will be opaque to the TIP agent and to the TAM. Well, if it is encrypted, it's also opaque to it. So it could be a little bit you know, confusing. And so rather than trying to clarify it, it seemed to read fine without that sentence. So all we did is we deleted the sentence. Uh, this one was, uh, I think, brought up before, and we actually have the text for it now. And so it was pointed out that the way that you do encryption was underspecified, but we had interoperable implementations, and other RFCs already had their documents, had the details. We just had to be explicit in here. And so I think Hannes wrote the text here that's copied onto the slide. And so instead of the strike through sentence, we replaced that with all the big block of text that's very explicit. Um, so, for example, um, it says there's multiple variants of the scheme, and it says which variant out of the ones it is. It's the one out of 9052, which was not previously a reference. Now it is. Um, another example, uh, in the bottom, the bolded text, it talks about the cozy KDF context, subpubinfo.other. It says the value must be set to suit report encryption when a suit report is encrypted, and must be set to eat encryption when an eat is encrypted. So the intent is now it's explicit, now that you can implement it uh, in a way that the implementations do and be interoperable. Okay. So we don't know of any errors in here. I think uh, Hannes did a good job of writing up exactly what the steps are. At least I think it was you, Hannes, right? Is this your text? Yeah. Um, so we think that this issue is now closed. The implementers have looked at it and the implementers seem fine with it. Okay. Just leaving it up there for a second in case anybody's still reading it, okay. All right. Um, we reference the eat spec and we define an eat profile. The eat spec recently changed to recommend a new convention for how you name the eat profiles in a media type. We used to use the URL of the draft, right? So you can see eat profile equals, and then there's the draft 12 URL. Um, and the eat spec now uh, recommends using the URN, you know, RFC convention that's up top. And so all we did is we followed that convention. And so now at the bottom, that's replaced with, you know, RFC XXXX with a note to the RFC editor, please replace XXXX with whatever the number is that gets assigned to this document. So it's just a new label for it. Okay. So now we snap to the latest version of eight, right? So we're trying to keep up with any normative references. Uh, and now that eat is <clears throat> done, uh, we hope that there's no more. Okay. All right. So that brought us to the beginning of the hackathon. Uh, and so uh, the result of the hackathon, we worked on draft 18, like during the hackathon and submitted it, what, just yesterday, whatever. Um, so here's the, so Akira briefly talked about this one. And so in the suit MTI document, if you go back to draft 01, which was the last version that was referenced in draft 17, um, it had like two algorithms, uh, which are the ones on the left, um, ES256 and EGDSA with A128 GCM. Uh, suit MTI is now on draft 03, and it has four algorithms, two for unconstrained, where the second one, A128 GCM, was changed to Cha-Cha Poly. And in the suit working group yesterday, uh, Brendan took an opportunity to explain why that change was made in suit MTI. And two more were added, which were for constrained nodes, right? Which is the uh, A128 CTR instead of GCM. So now suit MTI specifies four profiles. And we had to say, what do we do about that? Okay. Well, previously back in 01, a draft 01 on the left, um, we already had consensus that passed working group last call and so on that says the TAM must implement both, and the TEEP agent gets to pick either of them, you know, at least one of those, right? So you get, you get interoperability. 
So the natural answer, now that there's four, is to apply the same thing, right? The TAM must implement all four, and the TEEP agent gets to pick any one or more that it wants, okay? And since we had at the hackathon represented, uh, I don't know, five, six different implementations, including both TAM implementations and TEEP agent implementations, and we went around and everybody was okay with this, including the two TAM implementations were okay saying, yep, we're okay implementing all four things. Um, we just couldn't do that during the hackathon um, because Cha Cha Poly is not yet in Lawrence's T Cose implementation, but the other ones were, so we could do that part, but uh, we just didn't finish doing the Cha Cha Poly because that one needs an implementation of the crypto library. But we it agreed on this in principle, and so this is what we put into 18. Uh, I see Brennan's in queue, so. Do you think that we should provide additional guidance? that suggests that constrained and unconstrained uh, authors should be treated differently. Uh, in other words, is, it, is there a situation where we should change MTI to a subclass to either constrained or unconstrained implementations? Um, I'll give my personal opinion. My personal opinion is I, I'd like the text that's already in suit MTI, right? Where, you know, it explains that the uh, unconstrained ones are better and you can use those if you can, but for some reason, if you have to do it all in, you know, flash memory and one pass kind of thing, then you can use the constrained ones. And so it doesn't say it's for constrained or unconstrained. It says use the top ones if you can and bottom ones if you're in a special case. And my personal opinion is that's sufficient. Um, I wouldn't object if somebody else said you want to do that, but I don't think you need to make changes, that's my opinion. Okay, thank you. Just pause in case anybody else is gonna get up and respond to that, but otherwise. Okay. All right, so then we get to the one that was actually the big discussion at uh, the hackathon. So this is an issue that Ken ran into and filed and it generated a bunch of discussion here, which had to do with how you negotiate uh, suit cozy profiles. And so we step back to say, okay, what other negotiation mechanisms do we have? Let's just look at all three of them, see if there's any gaps in any of them. So the two that were um, uh, already well discussed is how you negotiate a freshness mechanism and how you negotiate a cheap cipher suite. So I got these on this slide and then the suit cozy profile negotiation is on the next slide. So what we do for freshness mechanisms, right? You have the query request message that comes from the town. The TAM gets to list in that query request, here is all the freshness mechanisms I support. And it's going to pick one that it thinks that the, um, that the TEEP agent is going to use and actually use it, right? So if it picks nonce, then it can actually put the nonce in that query request optimistically saying, um, let's not introduce an extra round trip, but say I support nonce and the other ones, and by the way, here's your nonce. And if it gets it right, and so the TEEP agent um, does it, then it'll go on. But if it gets it wrong, okay, the one that it used is not the one that the is not one that the TEEP agent supports. Then the TEEP agent sends back an error, unsupported freshness mechanisms, and it gets to list the one or ones that it supports, right? So the TAM has a way to learn it, but optimistically, it can try to guess right and then learn it if it happened to guess guess wrong. If on the other hand, it guessed right, and then the query response can just use it, right? I don't have the nonce, I'll just use the nonce in my query response and uh, the way that they get, way they choose the nonce. So that's how freshness mechanisms uh, ne are negotiated. Teep cipher suite negotiation, right? You say the first step is very similar. The query response gets to say, when the TAM sends it, here's the list of all the uh, Teep cipher suites that I support. And because the cipher suites are used with uh, Cozy sign and Cozy sign can support multiple algorithms, it will actually use all of them, okay? And so it sends a cozy sign with a bunch of signatures, you know, say two, whatever the number of signatures are, and it just signs it and it's an ORing, right? So as long as a TEEP agent can verify any one of those signatures because using the algorithm it has, then it's good. Um, if for some reason it gets it wrong, um, that it, um, you know, uh, only signed it with a subset of say the four and it, did, and the TEEP, TEEP agent is a constrained one and it was sent with the two, uh, say, unconstrained ones, something like that, what happens? Okay. So if it gets it wrong, then the error message has TEEP unsupported cipher suites and it gets to list the ones the agent supports, right? Very much like precious mechanisms. If it gets it right, the query response will then just use it and you know, sign messages with that algorithm. But it also would list it in the body and say, oh, by the way, here's the one that I'm using. 
Well, we looked at it and said, well, that's actually redundant information because when you're parsing the, the signature stuff, it's actually there in the envelope, right? So it doesn't provide you anything with something that you wouldn't already get, and it just introduces another error path to say, what if they're not, what if they don't match? The one that you use and the one that you say that you're using are different because you're saying it twice, right? Once in the envelope, once in the body of the heap message. So we said, well, that's extra superfluous information that's not necessary, bloats the message, causes extra error paths and things to test. Uh, and so we just removed that in 18, saying it actually didn't provide any value. Okay. And so this is relevant because one of the questions was, should we add it? Um, in the query response for the selected suit cozy profile negotiation. We said, nope, it's better to move, remove it from here than add it from there. So then that brings us to, well, these are sort of precedents. What do we do for, for negotiating uh, selected suit cozy profiles? And this one is a little bit more complicated because we have both manifests and suit reports. So we got like two different subcases. So here we go. So again, first step is very similar. The query request gets to list all the ones that the TAM has. Um, optionally, the query request can pass the attestation evidence of the TAM itself. And along with that, it can optionally pass the, uh, any suit reports about the you know, attestation of the TAM. So if the TAM itself has some suit reports from it booting, it can optionally include those, right? Um, and so for some reason, if the agent wants to use the suit reports in addition to the evidence and deciding whether the TAM is good, it can do that, okay? It's just a may. Uh, but that introduces a case that says, well, what if it sends a suit report that the TEEP agent would pay attention to, but it was signed with a cozy profile that the TEEP agent doesn't have, okay? So this is this case that we said, well, what do you do in this case? And there was no error for that or whatever. So the part in red is what was added in uh, draft 18. Uh, and this is the first part of what Ken filed. And so we added another error code that says unsupported suit report. Um, and we had the ability to just list which ones the agent has. So if you want to send, resend the suit reports, you can find one that the TEEP agent could actually parse, or, you know, uh, uh, check the signatures and stuff on. If on the other hand, you got it right with suit reports, then the query response, there's nothing to do. Um, you just continue on with a regular protocol. Um, and so later on, when you want to pass a manifest from the TAM, right? So the manifests uh, that come in an update message. So the TAM sends an update message, sends some manifests in there. Okay, the manifests are signed with, you know, or use the suit cozy profile. Um, and again, you have that could be right or it could be wrong. Well, hopefully the TAM is smart enough to only send manifests to the device that actually matter, right? But we have to say what happens if it doesn't. Okay. Uh, so here, we, there's already uh, an error, which was the er manifest processing failed, which is any type of manifest failure, whether it's suit cozy profile or anything else in the commands. Um, and there was already the ability to pass suit reports there. And so we said, well, we don't need to pass, you know, exactly what failed inside there. We just say suit manifest or the manifest processing failed. Why? Because the suit report already contains all the details, right? The details of what failed and so on. And so the suit report had a suit report result code, an integer that was undefined. Uh, so we didn't know what to fill it into there. And so that's what generated discussion that we talked about in the suit working group yesterday and came to a conclusion on. And so um, Brendan is gonna update with a couple of uh, uh, suit specific values in there. And so that will be pending the next version of suit report, but it means that there's nothing to say in the T protocol document because that will be in the suit report. And we already referenced that. Um, and then there was a question here in parentheses, which is what uh, Brendan just responded to in email about an hour and a half ago, uh, which was uh, before when we said, if there's a failure, you say, I couldn't process that. And then how do you communicate back to the TAM which ones you do support? Right? That was the question. And so we, at the hackathon, we said, well, we could put that into TEEP, but it seems better to put it into suit reports so that it could be used with any transports other than TEEP2. And so that's what we talked about in the suit meeting yesterday. Um, and Brendan said, there's actually already a way to do that. And that was the message he posted to suit about an hour and a half ago is here's it's a suit crypt, whatever it was, uh, which is a series of integers. And you click on suit list and the, the, the hints to us as implementers is, is that's the field in the suit report for us to report this and it's already there. So I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, but it looked, it looked fine to me to answer your question, Brendan. Go ahead. So in, in actual fact, it's not in the suit report and that's the question. There's a suit capability report, which is a separate data structure. And that has purposefully not been put in suit report. It's a separate thing because uh, we currently haven't defined a manifest that triggers a capability report. 
uh, because that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So since the suit report is a report of what happened in manifest processing, the capability report, which tells you what the manifest processor can do, is not returned in the suit report. The question to you is, does that need to be in the suit report? And under what circumstances would it be generated? Because it doesn't make sense to me to hand a capability report back on every single report. Okay, so the uh, CBOR field that you mentioned is not in the suit report. Is that from the suit manifest? Where was the actual production? It's that you the quoted? suit capability report, which is yeah, which, a separate which, document yeah. also defined in the suit reports draft. It's still in the suit reports internet draft. Yes, but it's a separate data structure that does not get used with the suit report. Gotcha. Um, to answer your question, yes, I think that particular piece um, should be capable of being put into the suit report. And under what circumstances, I would say when there is a specific value that you're going to tell me of the suit report result code, that means uh, algorithm failure. So then you would generate a full capability report, including all of the different uh, fields in the manifest that are supported, all of the different algorithms that are supported, all of the different parameter values that work with it. Um, anything that is relevant to the suit cozy profile. If it's relevant to say, what conditions do you support or something like that, I would say no, because the error is not a condition error, it's a suit cozy profile error. Okay, I understand that, but the situation that we're constructing now is where the report generator has to introspect the uh, error code, make a guess as to what kind of information the author needs about the uh, capabilities, and then generate that section of the capability report, not the whole capability report, and send that back. I'm not sure I think that makes sense. I think it makes a lot more sense to me to have the capability report generated on request rather than in the response to any error. If for no other reason than what you're talking about would generate an amplification, amplification attack where I could send a malformed suit manifest with an incorrect cozy object and instantly get a response that contains a report of everything the device can do. Um, I'm not sure I buy the amplification attack because it only comes in an authenticated message that would be dropped if it doesn't come from a source. So the only thing that you can attack is yourself. No, no, no. That's the thing. I can send it a message that's not authenticated, right? I can send it a manifest that's not authenticated. The manifest doesn't contain a valid signature, but contains a uh, algorithm identifier that the device is known not to support. No, I'm saying it comes in a TEEP message. The TEEP message comes from a TAM and will be dropped if it doesn't come from the authorized TAM. The TAM already has full control over what code you can run in that, at least within that trust domain. I appreciate that, but that is a TEEP specific issue and we're talking about modifying suit report. Okay, that's a fair discussion for the suit working group, but I, uh, I think... Um, uh, you made a statement or two I just wanted to comment on about what okay. it forces the manifest processor to do. And I was saying um, there's uh, a flexibility if you were to say, if you're arguing, if you were to argue, and it sounded like you were first arguing for and then again, so I'm not sure I got which way that you got, so I just comment in general. Um, if you say you want to generate the full capability report and say, well, that might be overkill in some cases, but it would work. And I'm saying the minimum necessary is to generate a specific uh, piece of it. Okay? And I'm saying as long as you generate at least the specific piece of it, then it's just an optimization. You can put it as a may or a should or whatever else. I think your separate point is whether it should be triggered by an error or only available on request. And I think that's an orthogonal question. Yes. And I would say available on request introduces an extra round trip. And I think think this is a case that is so that is very unlikely to occur, um, it, it, meaning it's a very rare event to, to be able to have 
a case where you get this uh, suit cozy profile error. But if it does happen, then it probably doesn't matter as much as to whether it's, you know, one round trip or two because it is rare in the first place. So that's why I guess I don't have a strong opinion either way on that one. Yeah, I agree with you on that point. Um, and that sort of goes back to my, um, my gut reaction is to leave it out of the suit report. But if there's a strong need to put it in, then we need to have a further conversation around the circumstances under which it's generated. Um, I would guess, I would say from a TEAP protocol perspective, um, we don't have another way to like request it. Although if we thought that that was the right thing, there's a data items requested bit field and that's where we can say, hey, we'd like to get your suit reports or we'd like to get, you know, whatever else it is that's not specific to suit. So there is a bit we could define if we thought it was important. Um, I, I would like to not have to arrive the the TEAP protocol, but if that's the right thing, then we can do that. Uh, but it sounds to me like... That, like but we'd want to know that today, right? Yeah. <laughs> is this something that needs to go back to the, the suit list or is this something where you want to get this nailed down right now? Um, as a T protocol spec author, um, okay. I'd rather have it be nailed down right now as far as what the TEEP working group recommends. Um, and then of course, suit can, but uh, suit can make a decision based on that, but I'd like to have because uh, there's a number of uh, implementers that are here, right? E either virtual or remote. So um, if people understand this, this is, if it gets it wrong, this is primarily for uh, TEEP agent implementers, right? It says, okay, if you get an error here, do you want to be able to send this back immediately? Or do you want to have to deal with it at the query request time? If there's a data item requested, then you, then the query response then has to have a way of having the uh, suit capability report or whatever it's called. Um, and so we'd introduce a new field for that in the current response and allocate a bit in the data items requested. Um, that seems like m more complexity in the TEEP implementation for a case that will almost never happen. Yeah, yeah that, that makes a certain amount of sense to me. Um, I, look, we're still re revising the suit report as it stands anyway. Uh, I don't have a... I don't think I'm against uh, putting a field in and saying that it's optional to include based on application specific policy. That's and what I would prefer. Yeah. I think that should resolve the issue and should allow you to move forward. Okay, so let me get a sense of the room then because that is actually a proposal. So the proposal is uh, that we deal with it in the suit report by having an optional field with the suit report says it's up to the implementation. Uh, do you have a terse articulation of that, Brendan? I mean, I understand exactly what you mean. I'm trying to get down to only a couple words. Brendan, since this is the last issue, I think it it'd is. be good to do a show of hands. So I'm yeah. trying to figure out how to articulate it in the poll. Okay, so the proposal is that suit report will include the suit capability report in its data structure. The it will be an optional field, and the explanatory text for it will say... Okay, you're going to have to go slower. <laughs> suit report <laughs> optionally includes capabilities. Okay. I'm just trying to reduce rewards. Yes, for there you go. Okay, we'll include an optional. We'll optionally include, or include optional, both mean the same thing. Yeah, um, capabilities. Okay, given that I, I and, might have. And I this means that the TEAP protocol does not have any new fields or bits or whatever. Right? That, that's what that proposal means. Okay, so poorly typed, but <laughs> the intent is. I'd like to see a show of hands if you agree with the proposal of having an optional capability in the suit report. It's a yes from me, so. Specifically, if yes. you are an implementer, please vote. And please don't have no opinion. <laughs> okay. I mean, because I know that there's at least you six... can have an opinion even if yeah, you're yeah, not yeah. implementing I, it. Right I'm now. saying I want the minimum <laughs> number, including myself, to be at least six, because I know there's six implementers, including myself. So, it's... to be honest with you, I suspect that any no's that show up would show up in the suit working group, not in the T one. Right. Right. Yeah. 
And that's fine, because this is not a suit consensus. This is a T no. recommendation. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, so there are actually um, zero no's and mm -hmm. eight positive. So I think mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. direction there. Okay. Um, if, I'll make a proposed first. change for the, okay. for the suit report and post it to the suit mailing list for confirmation. Okay, yeah. thank you. If the note takers can please annotate that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's at least one last slide here. I don't remember if there's anything after this. This, yeah, all the issues are now discussed, right? I don't remember what was after this because it says two out of three. So I remember there was something after this. Is there another slide? There it is. Okay. So just to summarize what we've already talked about, here's what happened in 18, right? We removed the redundant suit teep cipher suite um, because you can get that from the envelope. We added uh, supported suit close a profiles to the error message. So you can report what you support in the uh, suit reports case. I mean, the, the malformed suit reports case um, for consistency with the other two mechanisms. We added a, an error code. And then we added a paragraph as to how to use. So previously, um, we had added the ability for suit reports of the TAM to appear in the query request. But the section that talked about how to process the query request contained no text saying what to do with them. So this is the text that was added, uh, which kind of goes along with what it says to do about the TAM's um, uh, attestation payload. So it says it may use in any implementation specific way. We're not going to tell you how. Uh, just like we don't tell you how to use the evidence or the, the attestation payload. Um, the suit reports and determining whether it trusts the TAM. So we tell you the purpose of it. And you can implement your own way of whether you use the, uh, the suit reports for logging or if you use them as part of a verifier, whatever it is. Okay. Um, so you use it to decide whether you trust the TAM. And if it doesn't work, then you use the unsupported suit report and supply the supported suit cozy profiles. And this is for the bad suit report case, not the bad manifest case that we were just talking about. And I think uh, draft 18 contains all of that stuff. That's what we submitted yesterday, branch predicting that everybody would be okay with it. And so we've now presented what we just did across the hackathon time. And so we don't know of anything else to change in the document. Okay. And so we leave it to the chairs to figure out, you've already gone through a working class call, which but that was on a previous version, right? Already have the document shepherd right up. Okay. And so chairs can decide what the next step is for how we progress. So. I've seen all the issues in the GitHub have been resolved, but uh, there have been significant changes since mm -hmm. the last working group last call. So I think we should have at least a two week working group. Yeah, that's what I was going to expect you to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm so, hoping that by then we will have the suit confirmation that uh, the changes that we are yeah. doing in suit is good enough. So. so that's presuming the suit working group doesn't have a cow about adding the option. Oh, you can do a working group last call now anyway, right? It would just be oh, results yeah, yeah, yeah. that came in for that. But okay. if they yeah. change, then that means we have to react, right? But I'm kind of so. branch predicting since Brendan is uh, right. the one that made the proposal. So it's, it's, Well, I'm just trying yeah, to lay yeah. out no, that's good. the scenario. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. So when do you want to start the working group last call then? Um, the two week can, one. So the question is, we're into Thanksgiving. Correct. So, and we want to do it. So I, we said two week. Yeah. But do we want to count for Thanksgiving? So we can start it next week. Mm -hmm. So it might be three weeks because people take Thanksgiving in the US. Thanks. Anybody awake and paying attention here in the room? Yeah. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. Gobble, Sounds gobble. Good. Okay. Three weeks might be enough to allow suit to sort it out. Gosh, I would hope so. Uh, if there was a suit chair in the room, then. Uh... <laughs> well, oh. technically there is, but there won't be on Friday. Oh. So. Wait. I think Dave, hold on. Dave's on. Dave Walter Meyer, are you on? I think he was remote for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he is. There he is. Okay. All right, Dave. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out, do I need to do anything As between now and Friday? As suit chair. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay if we, because um, we'd be looking at closing the working group last call likely first week of first December. First of December, yeah. You, you can unmute yourself. Dave, Dave, you there? 
Dave, we see you on the queue, but we're not hearing you. Is the good thanks on the chat referring to my question to you on the timeline? We need a three-way handshake. Huh? What's that? Yeah. Well, but, but I'm looking at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's been busy. Okay. okay. So he's, he's saying good thanks. Okay. Thanks, Great. Dave. All right. All right. I'm done. I'm going to prematurely say congratulations to the group. I mean... You know, we've got interoperability, we've got some formal verification, and we're getting close to the finish line. You want to I think the team's meeting every hackathon and consistently working on it. I think tremendous progress in the last couple of years and uh, hoping it will pass working to last call. And I think it will be an RSP editor queue for some time, but I think it should cross all the other hurdles. So I think with that, we're gonna issue the working group last call. I don't, I mean, we still welcome the hackathons and the progression on the verification, but at this point, again, I'm gonna be optimistically premature and say, I don't know that we'll have a need for any more in-person. So let's just continue the communication over the mail list and we can determine whether we need more interims for further discussion and I'm not foreseeing any, but if we need to, we can also hold another last session. So, um, so unless there's one informational working group adapter document, I think we can start reviewing that after this is done. So more reviews are welcome so we can close on that. We need to reach out to them also. Yes. Okay, unless we have two minutes left. Any other business? Going once. Ooh, Dave's getting up. Um, if this is the last time we're meeting in person, I just want to say thanks to Nancy and Hiro for chairing the working group and all these sessions in person. So nicely done. Well, if, it, if it wasn't obvious, we were thanking you, all of you, for job well done and, and carrying this through. So. All right, so with that, we are adjourned. Enjoy the rest of the ITF.